Hello out there in Radio Land. This is Michael. This is the Street Preacher's Corner, the podcast brought to you by Grits and Sweet Tea. Not that they're sponsors or anything, but <clears throat> if it wasn't for Grits and it wasn't for Sweet Tea, I would have perished oh so many years ago. Well, Mark chapters or Mark Mark lesson seven is where we're at. We're going to talk about the second temptation of Jesus Christ. The, you, the, we 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 battle various technical difficulties on this end from time to time, and uh, uh, this is, I think, the fourth time I've recorded this. And uh, I was considering just like not just you know if this doesn't work, then you you'll never hear it because it'll be uh, you won't hear it. But anyway, we're in Mark chapter one. <clears throat> I had read some stuff. I did all kind of clever stuff uh, at the beginning, and you'll just never know because because at the last moment something happened, and, and we were we were without the copy of the thing we had done. If I can ever figure out how to record uh, and and sort of glue things together with software, that'd be that'd be helpful. But our policy here, our, our practice, I guess, is better say, is we just record this once, uh, straight through. There's no editing. There's no, um, you know, I mean, if it. It's a total piece of junk, then we delete it and we start over as if we didn't do it, except for the fact that I keep mentioning it. So Mark chapter 1, we are still in verse 13, and he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan. He was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered unto him. Now, to get the full picture, as we've said before, with so much of Mark, you have to look at the other accounts. So we're going to pick up Matthew chapter 4, and we're going to pick up Luke chapter 4 as well. See if I can get that halfway put together there. So, Mark chapter 4 says, um, says um, verse 5, Then the devil taketh him up into a hold of the holy city, and set up on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. That's Matthew 4. Now, Luke, Luke picks up uh, in uh, verse 9, Luke 4, 9. And he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest any time thou shalt dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Now, before we go, <clears throat> too much further. Um, we got to talk about you know what I consider kind of the elephant in the room. So if you take the accounts of of, of Matthew and the accounts of of Luke, um, and you lay them on top of each other, you can't help but notice that the that the order is different. Um, and if you haven't noticed, then I, I, I assure you, skeptics have, and they've made whole uh, issues out of this. And I'm working on a, a whole thing about inerrancy and discrepancies and how, how you should handle those. You know, is the Bible inerrant or is it just reliable? And that's a great question to ask, and it's a great question to answer. Um, and so let me say this. I don't want to I don't want to preach that sermon here because uh, although, you know, I'm sure I will mention it in passing like I am now. Um, let me say this. The Bible um, can take your scrutiny, and, and there's always a solution uh, when you have two problematic passages, when you have uh, two two problematic situations, there's always the solution, even if it's not an easy one and even if it's not an obvious one. The answer when you're addressing uh, perceived discrepancies or, or disharmonizations or whatever you want to call it, the answer is not to see ground to skeptics and assume your Bible has contradictions. So we're going to look at these two accounts, and we just read them. Matthew 4, 5 through 7, Luke 4, 9 through 12. Now, here's my take, whatever this is worth, on the difference in order. Now, first of all, um, <clears throat> it is, in my opinion, it is a cop-out uh, to just say it doesn't matter. Just look To look at the fact that these three temptations are not listed in the same order and just shrug your shoulders and throw up your hands, okay, it doesn't matter. Of course it matters. If it's written down, it matters. And saying, I don't know, is better than saying it doesn't matter. But if you look closely, the account in Matthew lists the first temptation, and then it says then. Luke lists the first temptation, but says and. You say, well, that's no big deal. No, it's a big deal, because then and and are not the same word. So Luke is tr- is not trying to tell you the story in order. Matthew is. So the proper order of events, the, the proper chronological order of events, would be... Um, under my theory, under my explanation, 
Uh, the first temptation of the commandment is to turn stones into bread, then the visit to the pinnacle of the temple, and then the offer of the kingdoms of the world. And that's how you get around that. That you look, you look at, it, you say, well, one of them is in chronological order, and one of them isn't, and one of them isn't trying to be in chronological. So if Luke had said then and then and then, then you'd have a problem. You'd have something. You'd have you have a situation. You have to find some way around. But that's not what's going on. One one gospel account says then, list them in order. The other one says and, and just list them. It's sort of akin to if you, uh, and this might not, this might not be the best analogy, but um, sort of akin that if you if you were recounting your day to your wife. And you were going through, and you, you know, you, you could go, you could say, yeah, so, so, you know, I went to work, and I went to the store, and I went to Lowe's, and I went out to the, to the woodpile, and, and so, you know, you, you could say, and, and those, those events that might not necessarily be in order, but if you say then, then it's a different deal in, indeed. This probably doesn't matter to most of the people listening, but it's a big deal, because if it's written down, it's a big deal. But setting that aside... Um, hopefully my, my, my explanation, my treatment of that made sense that Matthew is in order and Luke and Luke isn't, and Luke isn't trying to be in order. Um, but, uh, my, my point is that your Bible does not have errors or contradictions or discrepancies. And if it looks like it does, then what you need to do is you need to keep looking. Uh, you take in a difficult passage or a set of passages and tra- saying it doesn't, it, it's an error. It doesn't, it doesn't harmonize the passages and it doesn't address the issue and it makes things much, much worse. And as we said in the Navy, you will see this material again. So anyway, anyway so Matthew 4, 5 <clears throat> is where we're going to look at. Uh, then the devil takes him up into the Holy City. We know the Holy City is Jerusalem from the account in Luke and probably 25 other places in your Bible where the Holy City is referred to as being Jerusalem. Um, and verse six, it says, uh, uh, saith unto him, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down for it is written. Now it, it's, it's interesting, uh, that once again, he throws out the, if thou be the son of God. And when the devil does this, he says, it is written. He's quoting a, a passage of scripture. He's quoting Psalm 91 verse 11 and 12. So we're going to look at this because this is very telling. If I can quit dropping my paper. Psalm 91, verse 11 says, uh, For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Thou sh- they, shall bear up their- they shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. So the devil quotes this verse. He, he quotes it incorrectly. He leaves out thee in all thy ways, which is important because that's a conditional statement. And then he skips over verse 13. Thou shalt tread upon the lion out of the young lion and the dragon shalt thou tr- trample under feet. So <clears throat> it's kind of funny to me um, that he doesn't want to have an in-depth Bible study about, about how the V of Psalm 91 is supposed to trample the dragon. I think that's very humorous to me that when he quotes the verse, he first of all, he leaves that part out. He leaves a piece out. He leaves out in all thy ways. Um and he and he 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 doesn't want to talk about it. Psalm uh verse 13. We were downtown San Diego one night. This is a million years ago. This is probably, uh, I don't know, 1997 or something. And uh, it, the world was a wicked place back then. But the world was less insane than it is now. And uh, even in liberal California, where uh, where things were crazy, things were not as crazy as they are now. But anyway, so I'm on the street corner I'm preaching. Corner of 4th and Broadway, I'm pretty sure is where we're at. And uh, these guys came up behind me, and they were they were flaming. Homosexuals. They were. They were. They were effeminate. I mean, they weren't drag queens. You know, no one's going to let them read their kids' uh, story time. You, 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 can you even imagine if you went back? I don't know. To, not even ten, fifteen years, and you tried to explain to someone back then the most reprobate person you could find um, what was going to be accepted and normal, and how supposedly normal people would fight for the weirdest nonsense. Just a few years. Just a few years down the road. But anyway, so these fellows, they were very effeminate. They were very soft-spoken. They had the, the stereotypical lisp of somebody that, 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 oddly enough, shows up with that one sin. Uh, people are just, they, they you know, it's just, it is what it is. And But they were really excited about what I was saying. They weren't hostile towards me. They were they were actually worse. They were friendly towards me. And they were very excited, and they wanted everyone to know that they, they agreed with me, and they wanted to know everybody to know 
uh, that in the midst of their obvious uh, wickedness and in the midst of their obvious sexual perversion, uh, they were they really love Jesus. And, uh, it, you know, it is one thing for a man to say, I'm not all I should be. I have these issues in my life. I have these struggles in my life. And I love Jesus. Every man that's honest could say that. Um, but for a man to say, I am celebrating my sin, I am parading my sin, and I love Jesus, that's a little bit harder sell for anybody who knows Jesus or knows anything, anything about Jesus. Could a man be... Uh, saved and, and, and struggle with things? Absolutely, everybody does. Could a man be saved and not understand uh, how offensive his behavior is? Absolutely, that, that happens to everybody from time to time, but these guys knew better, and they were they were going to be, they were going to be loud and proud, but they but they wanted, they wanted the whole world to know that they were, that, that I was, and it was sort of like that situation in the book of Acts, where Paul is, uh, is preaching, and there's that woman there that has, the, has the, uh, the, the divining spirit, and, and she tells people, these men are here to show us the way of the most high God, or whatever, however she says it. It was very much like that. They were they were like, listen to this man. He's telling us the truth. He's we love Jesus, and, and and they were very vocal in their thing. And I would start saying a verse, and they would finish the verse, or they would say it along with me, in their loud, lispy, effeminate voices. And it was it was grieving me, man. It was grieving. I was I wasn't entirely sure what to do about it. I mean, you know, you don't want to be mean to folks. I mean, sometimes you want to be mean to folks. You shouldn't be mean to folks. You you sometimes want to be. But uh. So what I did, I had my Bible with me. I opened up to Romans 1, and I started preaching out of Romans 1. I was just reading Romans 1. And all of a sudden, their enthusiasm for my ministry died down, and they wanted no part of this, and they no longer wanted to be affiliated with this guy in the corner, and they left, which was fine by me. I could go back to what I came there to do. And so it's very akin to the situation here in Psalm 91, where the devil does not want to talk about verse 13. He wants to misquote verse 11, and he wants to leave out verse 13 entirely. And that's just how it is, you know. We we all have that sort of thing where we we avoid uh, we avoid uh, things that deal with our sin, and we move on to somebody else's because that's that's way more fun, and it's you know it's it's way easier to see other people's sin than it is to see mine. Uh, now, growing up in superstitious Louisiana, Louisiana was is not the same place it was when I was a kid. Um, you know, TV and mass media has made sure that everybody is pretty much the same now all over the country. But back in the back in the day. Um, uh, Louisiana was a very, uh, uh, mystical place, a very, uh, spiritualistic place. Uh, I grew up and I went to, I went to school, you know, in, 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 in junior high and in, in, in elementary school with people whose, whose parents were voodoo priestesses and, and, uh, and, 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 and just baked into the culture. There is a certain amount of superstition and a certain amount of, um, of just, you know, voodoo mysticism, whateverness. And it, it blends real well with the Catholicism that's down there. Which is why you can go to Marie Laveau, you can go to Marie Laveau's tomb in New Orleans, and you can see that it's a Catholic shrine and a Voodoo shrine because the two run side by side. But anyway, it's growing up in superstitious Louisiana. I was told uh, it was sort of you know a known thing that that you know devils and uh, evil spirits and uh, people that were you know messing around with witchcraft they couldn't quote the Bible. They couldn't say there's certain things they could they just they couldn't. I was told as a kid they could they could say the Lord's Prayer backwards, but they couldn't say it forwards. Well, that's just nonsense. I mean, I don't even know how that would even work. Uh, but you see here that the devil quotes scripture. The devil uses scripture. But whenever he uses it, he tweaks it, he twists it, he leaves stuff out. And so that's that's this is a perfect example of that. And uh so yeah, it, I mean, it turns out that you know devils and witches and foul spirits they can they can quote scripture and they do a pretty good job. In fact, you look at a really good example of this. Let's look at Genesis two. You're gonna look at three versions of the same sentence, the same command. Genesis two seventeen. <laughs> this is the Lord speaking, Adam. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest it, thereof thou shalt surely die. So the command is: if you eat the tree, thou shalt surely die. Well, just a few verses later, uh, Mrs. Adam, Eve, is, is talking to the serpent there. And this is verse uh, 3. And when she quotes it, she quotes it as, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. So already she's added a commandment, and she left, she's left a couple of words out. When the serpent repeats it back to her, verse 4, And the serpent said to the woman, Ye shall not surely die. He quotes the verse. 
I mean, he, he's he's quoting the converse of it. But he, when he quotes the verse, he includes the surely. He didn't hear that from her because she didn't say it. So I submit to you that he knew exactly what the command was. He'd heard it firsthand. That's why he got it right and she got it wrong. So, you know, he, let's say he quotes it better than she does. And so what a blessing that is. Maybe. Now, now, let, let me confess some ignorance here, though, because <clears throat> he quotes Psalm 91. And when he uses, the, he talks, he says, if thou be the son of God, which makes me think uh, he's handling as if it's a passage expressly connected to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, you know uh, the, we talked in the first temptation about how he says, if thou be the son of God, command these stones be made into bread. And he said that because that's one of the proofs that Jesus Christ was who he said he was, was that he would, you know, manifest bread supernaturally in the wilderness of Israel. And we talked about that at length, and uh, and nobody listened to it, but it's okay. I think one, I think I got one view on that video. That's okay. Um. So, so he quotes another one. He handles it as if it's a passage, especially connected to Jesus Christ, if thou be the Son of God. And there are parts of Psalm 91, if you read it through, that seem to only apply to Jesus Christ. But I don't really know how or when those things come into play. It looks like Jesus Christ is supposed to do something that is connected to Psalm 91, 11, and 12. Uh, but uh, when? I have no idea. Here's what I do know. Uh, Jesus' future was already mapped out. It had been from the foundation of the world. Okay? Uh, once God says something, once God commits something to writing, God binds himself by it. He is bound by his word because he cannot lie. So long before Jesus Christ was born in a manger in Bethlehem, Isaiah 53 was on the books, and Psalm 22 was on the books. And so when he's born, those things have to happen. The scripture cannot be broken. Well, what's interesting, though, you could, t- you could take the position, you could take a very fatalistic position, that um, since Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22 have to happen, that until it's time for those to happen, Jesus Christ is completely safe no matter what happens to him, because the scripture cannot be, he has to die on Calvary's hill. That's where he's, he's preordained to die. You, you see where I'm going here? But even with Isaiah 53 on the books and Psalm 22 on the books, when there was a threat to baby Jesus, the angel of the Lord told them to flee to Egypt so that he'd be safe. You say, Mike, how does that work? I don't know. But it looks to me like the the, 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 uh, the, the, the essence of this, or at least one piece of this temptation here, is that we all know how this is going to work out, so you could just go ahead and do what you want. See, having those things, having those things being written, having those things being settled, that does not give Jesus or anybody else the liberty to take chances with their life and sort of count on God to spare them, you know, so the scriptures might be fulfilled. I mean, by way of comparison, as as, as a saved person, um, you are predestinated predestinated to be conformed to the image of Christ. That will happen because it's the Bible says so, and the scriptures cannot be broken. But that doesn't mean you can live like a reprobate and expect God to come along and just iron out the wrinkles or clean up the debris field you left as you as you rolled through town like a tornado. See that that thing where well God's got this because He said He'll He's got it so I can do whatever I want. Another example, maybe even a better example, um, the. Uh, Let's say, you know, I mean, the Bible says that God's going to feed us. The God, Bible says that, you know, I've never seen the, the righteous uh, begging bread and, and, and however that verse goes. And so you could say, well, God has promised he's going to take care of me. I'm his property. I'm his responsibility. So therefore, I can be an idiot with my finances. And God will just clean it up because he's promised he would take care of me. Right? That is tempting God. I can prove that that's tempting God because we're going to look. Because when because when Jesus Christ quotes, Jesus Christ is quoting when he says, oh, look at, hold on, let's see, Matthew 4, I'm still back here in Genesis. Matthew 4, you would not believe that I have any notes at all, sometimes. Because I just go off and do whatever. If you're prone, let me hit the pause button here for a second. Not the actual pause button, because I never have figured out how that works. Um, Not the actual pause button, the metaphysical pause button. Um, 
before I forget, if you are inclined to pray for the lost, and you should be, uh, would you please pray for a fellow named, named Adam? We witnessed him in Savannah. He's lost. He knows he's lost. Um, we led him to the Lord, and then when he got there, he made a different decision than I was hoping he would make. Uh, you know, you always you always try to lead someone to the Lord, and, and we say to lead somebody to the Lord, like that means they got saved. And, and Mr. Stevenson used to say on the streets, he'd say, you know, did you lead someone to the Lord? And when they got there, they made the right decision. Well, Adam, he made the wrong decision. He, he, uh, uh, he, he, he heard enough gospel to save the whole world. And, uh, and then he decided, I need to think about this some more. And he walked away. So just pray for Adam. Pray. This is not the first time a street preacher has talked to him. This is not the first time he's heard the plan of salvation. He's 25 years old. He's lost. He knows he's lost. And he just assumes God's going to give him another chance. The burden of the ministry is a real thing. If you're, if you're, if this is a game, if this is something you just do to check a box, and there are days like that, then you'll talk to somebody like Adam, and once they're out of your venue, once they're out of your 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 not venue, once they're out of your sight, you won't think too 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 licks about them. But when you really are burdened for what for what awaits men if they reject Jesus Christ, you'll think about it. I'm sorry. Matthew 4. <clears throat> uh, it says, verse 7, Jesus said to him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So we're going to turn to Deuteronomy 6, which is what Jesus Christ is quoting here. He's quoting Deuteronomy 6. So we're right over there. We're going to see what is going on in Deuteronomy 6. It's interesting to me that that's where he went, because it is actually very important that that's where he went. And if I can ever find Deuteronomy, there we go. And I missed it again. Deuteronomy 6, verse 16. You shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Massa. That's what he's quoting. He leaves off the part of you as you tempted him in Massa because it's not relevant. But the context of Deuteronomy 6 is, uh, is that they tempted him in Massa. What in the world happened to Massa? Well, let's look in Exodus 17 and find out what happened in Massa. And maybe that'll give us some, some insight into what Jesus thinks this temptation is all about. <clears throat> uh, verse 17, I'm sorry, chapter 17, verse 1, All the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Or if the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? So chatting with Moses is tied to tempting the Lord, okay? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people and take with thee of the elders of Israel and thy rod wherewith thou smote the river. Take in thy hand and go. Uh, behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Oreb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, and that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elder of Israel. Verse 7 says, And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because the chiding of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? So here's the situation. Uh, God had promised to deliver them. God had promised to feed them. God had promised to water them. God had promised to bring them into the land promised unto their fathers. And here they are saying, is God going to do this? Is God even interested in us? Is, is God here or is God not here? Challenging God's provision. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to take... They're they're trying to take a... Uh, <clears throat> so I couldn't do Deuteronomy 6, 6. I'm sorry, 16. Jesus is drawing a parallel between Exodus 17 stuff and this situation that he's in right now, this particular temptation. And in Exodus 17, the people are trying to take a promise of God and use it to push God into a corner. You know, it's funny how God told Joshua, um, uh, what's, the, what's the quote? How long will it be ere they believe me? And the irony of ironies is that God is the one person who never lies. He's the one person that nobody ever believes. 
But the promise was that they would bring uh, he would bring them to uh, Canaan land, and every time it got hard, they tried and failed to beat God over the head with a promise he had made, as if God needed to be reminded of what he had promised. So there you go. So so now so now the devil says, well, God said he'd take care of you. I got a verse here in Psalm ninety one that says, if you jump off this temple, he'll send angels to come rescue you. So why don't you go and do it? And that'll prove that you're the son of God. In a game like that, the only way to win that game is not to play. And rather than prove God is faithful by jumping off, he proves himself by trusting in the wisdom of the Father by once again not bypassing the cross. You see, I, you can't take Psalm 91 and say, well, that means if he jumped off the temple building, God would have rescued him. I, I, we don't know what would have happened. We know Isaiah 53 has to happen. We know Psalm 22 has to happen. We don't know what happens if he comes off the top of that temple. See? So the temptation there is to take a promise of God and misuse it. Take a promise of God and use it to, to draw attention to yourself or, or to provide some, 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 something for yourself. That's, there's a lot of different angles of this temptation here in in, in, uh, in, uh, in Matthew 4 and Luke 4 and Mark uh, Mark 1. So in regards to that temptation, that's what I, that's what I got. I wish I had something really, like really profound and deep. Um but I don't. Um so so that's it. That's 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 the second temptation. Uh to throw himself off the temple. Um Yeah. So Hey man, if you think, if you got a better theory, by all means, man, lay it on me. I, I am open to hearing things. Uh, I'm open to hearing things. Anyway, I'm going to close this out uh, in the last couple of minutes here. Uh, this is Michael, and uh, thank you for listening. Those of you that are uh, people of, of, that know me have personally reached out and said nice things about what's going on here, and and uh, it's very kind of you. Thank you. And uh, yeah, all right. Well, I guess I will. Shut this thing down, and I will see you on the other side.